Iodine is an essential element. We can't live without it. We can't manufacture it. So we have to get it from our diet or we supplement with it. Stress is the inflammation that robs us of life, energy, and happiness. Our typical solutions for gut health and hormone balance have let a lot of us down. We're over-medicated and underserved. At The Less Stressed Life, we're a community of health-savvy women exploring solutions outside of our traditional Western medicine toolbox and training to raise the bar and change our stories. Each week, our hope is that you leave our sessions inspired to learn, grow, and share these stories to raise the bar in your life and home. All right, today on The Less Stress Life, I have Dr. David Brownstein, MD, who's a board-certified family physician who utilizes the best of conventional and alternative therapies. He is the medical director for the Center for Holistic Medicine in West Bloomfield, Michigan. He is a member of the American Academy of Family Physicians and serves on the board of International College of Integrative Medicine. He's the father of two beautiful physicians, which I think is such an accomplishment for both of your daughters to become physicians, Haley and Jessica, and is a retired soccer coach. So now we know he's also a human and doctor because sometimes when you write 16 books on the topics of iodine, B12, hormones, thyroid, arthritis, salt, foods, ozone, and more, you wonder how does this guy get it all done, but he has lectured internationally about the, his success using these natural therapies. And I would say one of my favorite things about him is that he is a storyteller. He uses a lot of case studies in the books, which I love. And I am a case study fiend. If it hasn't worked for people, like what works for people is what I care most about. So maybe that's why I like him so much. So welcome, Dr. Brownstein. Well, thank you for having me, Krista. Yeah. So you gave me one prompt. I went ahead and filled in like 20 more questions, but this is actually my favorite first question. And I think it's the one that kind of tells us if someone isn't familiar with you yet, it gives us a little background, you know, makes you really human because we all have these things. Tell us about how this all started for you. How did you get into holistic medicine? It's especially fun. You know, everyone comes, I just had a woman tell me this morning, she's like, well, why does my doctor know this? I'm like, well, no, we only know what we know. Right. And we're usually moved to change because we get frustrated to have a personal experience. So tell us about your foray from being an MD into more holistic medicine. How did that all start? You're right. Well, as, as physicians, you know, I could ask the question, you know, why doesn't my doctor know this stuff? And you're right, they only know what they know. And it usually takes a healthcare professional in an illness in themselves or an illness in a close family member or friend for them to start looking for alternatives if things aren't working out well. And then that's what happened to me. But so my story begins, I wanted to be a doctor since I was little. I wanted to model myself after my family doctor. And I grew up with a severe case of asthma with fair number of ER visits, and I was on medications, and back then asthma wasn't really well controlled. Well, it's not well controlled either now, but it was less well controlled then than it is now. So I, you know, I was at my family doctor a fair amount for that, and we didn't grow up in a holistic household. We had a conventional household. We went to the doctor when we were sick. We took whatever they prescribed. We never, I don't recall questioning anything from any doctor, and, you know, I didn't take any vitamins growing up. I didn't know about nutrition. It wasn't concerned with my diet or anything. So I just grew up in a what I would call a conventional, traditional household and mm -hmm. um, wanted to model myself after my family doctor and went to the University of Michigan for undergrad and Wayne State University School of Medicine for medical school, and then got into a family practice residency in my area in the Detroit metropolitan area and began doing what I wanted to do since I was what I recall five years old. And I liked my residency. I didn't deviate from what I was taught at any point in med school or residency. And I used to tell people back then, don't take supplements were a waste of money. The, you know, you get enough from food and nutritional deficiency diseases were a thing of the past. And so I, I finished my residency. I joined a busy family practice office in my area and I start practicing, you know, what I was taught. And I did it for about six months. And first few months I was happy and I was, you know, didn't ask for anything more. And I was looking to buy in for a partnership in the practice and got a lawyer. And around six months, we started negotiating the buy-in. And then right around that time, you know, I had the lawyer, we're negotiating a buy-in. I just stopped sleeping. I remember it. And sleep was hard to come by. I became anxious for really the first time. And you know, after a couple of nights of not sleeping, we're, you know, I'm getting up and getting ready to go to work. And I blurred out to my wife, Allison, I don't want to be a doctor anymore. And we met at 18 years old at 
at Michigan. And since she's known me, that's all I talked about was being a doctor, that that was my sole focus in life. And being a family doctor was my sole focus in life. And, you know, she looks at me incredulously. We had $100,000 in student loans at the time, and they were mostly mine. And she said, well, what's wrong? And I'm like, I don't know, but I'm not helping anyone. She goes, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm just prescribing drugs that most of them don't even need. You know, I, we, we were seeing, I don't know, 50 patients a day or something like that. Mm-hmm. And within 30 minutes, or it was actually a long visit, within 15, 20 seconds of a patient talking to me, I was already writing a prescription out for what they needed. And the rest of the visit didn't really matter. And I was out of that door in five or seven minutes, you know, or less. And I said to her, I don't think I'm helping anyone. I'm just prescribing drugs. Aren't treating the underlying cause of their illness. And then I'm having to prescribe more drugs to treat problems from the first drugs. She goes, Well, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I don't know, but I can't do this for the next three or four decades. And she said, Why don't you do another residency? And I'm like, Nah, I'm not doing that. One was enough of that. So, you know, I was floundering a little bit. And I go to work that day. And that day, I see this patient who's been bothering me for a while to meet his chiropractor. And at that point in my career, I never referred to chiropractors. I used to tell people, Don't go. I never met one, never talked to one, never knew what the philosophy was, never knew what they did. I just knew they were dangerous. At least that's what I was taught. Mm -hmm. And he had been bugging me for a while. His wife and my wife worked together and drove in a car to work together. Mm -hmm. And we'd done some things socially with them. So in that lack of sleep and anxiety time at that time, that I put him off before when he told me to meet this chiropractor, I said, okay, fine, give me his number. So he gives me the number. I make a phone call from work that day. and. You know, we set a dinner date for the following Tuesday. And the, I get home from work on that Tuesday and I remember telling Allison, I'm going to cancel this. Dinner. I'm tired. I worked all day and this is a waste of time. And she said, you can't do that. It's too late. It would be rude. Go to dinner. And I'm walking out the door. She told me to be nice. And I go to dinner. His name was Dr. Robert Radke. Mm-hmm. He was 10 years older than me. And he, first off, we hit it off very well, very easily. It was just an easy friendship that we hit off right off the bat. Second off, He was talking about functional biochemistry, which I knew literally nothing about. I took Mm -hmm. biochemistry in my undergrad at the University of Michigan. I took it again in med school. And then we had reminders of it and lectures about it in residency. And it was nothing functional about that biochemistry. It was all just rote memory. And Mm -hmm. you could never correlate it with a patient in front of you. You're just trying to get through the test they were giving you on it. So Dr. Radke is talking to me about functional biochemistry and what it means in the individual patient he's seeing and how he's trying to, you know, work with the patient's biochemistry. And either he starts telling me stories of his patients and either he's lying to me or there's another method of treatment or modality of treatment that I wasn't aware of. So he brought me a book at that meeting called Healing with Nutrition by Jonathan Wright, who was an allopathic physician and had about a two or three hour dinner that night. And, you know, we became good friends after that. We referred patients back and forth and very good long-term friendship after that. Came home and I read that book till the middle of the night. I remember reading till two in the morning. I was really focused on the section on cardiovascular diseases because my father was very ill at that time. He suffered his first heart attack at age 40, his second heart attack at 42. Over the next 20 years, he had two bypass surgeries and plasties. He was on 12 medications to control blood pressure, diabetes, hypertension. My dad was overweight. He smoked, never exercised a day in his life. Looked awful. Looked like he was going to die at any moment. He had like a pale, bluish color in his face. Like he was, wasn't oxygenating. And, you know, he was having continual angina for over 20 years where he was popping nitroglycerin pills like they were candy. And we were all waiting for the phone call that he, you know, that he died at that time. So I read that chapter till late at night. I get up to go to work and I'm energized that morning. And I called my dad when I got to work. And I said, can you stop at my office before or after work? I want to draw some blood work on you. So based on what I learned from Dr. Radke, what I read in that book, I drew two blood tests on him. Uh, the blood tests were thyroid levels, and I drew a whole panel of thyroid levels that I wasn't drawing before, just drawing one thyroid test, and I drew his testosterone level. Now, he was seeing the best doctors in the Detroit metropolitan area, and like I said, he was on 12 different medications, but no one had bothered to check his testosterone levels ever. When the re- I got the results back, they were less than detectable limits, so near zero, and no one had bothered to check a full thyroid panel ever. And his thyroid levels, though, in the reference range, if this is the reference range, they were in the lower part of the reference range. So I put him on two things. I put him on natural thyroid hormone and natural testosterone. And within seven days, his 
20 year history of angina melted away. I got a phone call that night at home said, Hey, I didn't have to use any nitro pills today. And I said, well, how many are you using a day? He goes anywhere from four to four to eight. And said, I had no chest pain today. It's the first time. And he goes, I think I'm feeling better from the stuff you're giving me. So he felt better and better. He never used another nitro pill the rest of his life at that point. 30 days later, he looks better. He's losing weight for the first time without changing any of his bad dietary habits. My dad could eat like the best of them. And he looked pink now, pink, mm. healthy color instead of this pale, pasty, bluish tinged, you know, face. And he was doing things. He was, you know, no chest pain. And and I drew his blood work 30 days later. His cholesterol in the 300s on medication fell below 200 without changing any of his dietary and you know, without exercising, changing his dietary habits. Mm-hmm. And in a short period from then on, I was able to decrease his medication from 12 to six a day. And of those six, he was on much lower doses, you know, half or more of whatever he was taking before. And once I saw that 30 days later, well, you know, I was starting to read in that time period too. I knew that's what I wanted to do in medicine. I went to the partners in my practice and said to them, I'm not going to buy in. I need to leave. How much time do you need for me? And they said, what's wrong? And I'm like, nothing's wrong. I want to go do holistic medicine. And they said, what's that? And I, at that point, I said, I don't know, but I'm going to have to figure it out. And they said, why don't you do it here? And I'm like, no, I can't do it here. I need, I need a holistic medicine office to do it, where I have nurses and front desk people and other colleagues who were all sort of working in the same paradigm and have the same energy. And so, you know, I got rid of the lawyer. I left. And I remember as I was leaving, my dad said to me, what are you doing? He goes, you're going to be a partner in that practice. You can't leave. I'm like, he goes, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I'm going to do holistic medicine. And he asked me the same thing. You know, what's that? I'm like, I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out. He goes, I think you should stay there and do it there. I'm like, you know, I'm doing this because I see the changes in you. And he goes, well, don't not be a partner because of me. I'm like, dad, I'm going to get this to work. And we, Allison was pregnant with our first when I did all this. And you know, I went to my wife first and said to her, I want to leave that practice. And she's, she was fine right off the bat. She said, what are you going to do? And I told her, and she goes, sounds good. And I, she goes, are you going to have enough patients? And I said, not at first. <laughs> said, well, how are we going to do this? She was working and then she went, she was quitting as she was getting near the, was near the end of her pregnancy. And I said to her, I'll work in the emergency room at nights or if I have to, weekends, we'll have enough money. I said, I got to give this a go. And she was all for it. And um, I started off seeing one or two patients a day. And now we have six practitioners in our office, including Mm -hmm. one of my daughters. And uh, my other one's coming in a year. She finishes her residency. So we'll have seven practitioners and we got a big office building and I don't know how many exam rooms, 14, 16, something like that. And as you said before, you know, I've written 16 books and very happy and very, very good way to practice medicine. Yeah. Oh, that's so much fun. You know what people will want to know? They'll say, "Uh, can we see one of Dr. Brownstein's physicians if we live in XYZ state? What's the, uh, we'll just go ahead and answer the question for them before we move on to anything else. So there are some laws about that Mm -hmm. and we have to see them once in person. Then we can do telemedicine. And I don't like telemedicine that much. I want to see people and I want to touch people and I want to Mm -hmm. be in front of them, but I still do it. And I do it for my patients who move out of state or, you know, I I do do it occasionally, but we do need to see people once and then we can establish a relationship and, you know, move on from there. Well, there were so many things that I resonated with in your story and I'm sure other people do because I think when you get into anything in health, right, you just want to help people. And so you had this early midlife crisis and the support from the most important person, which is great. So that was all you really needed. One more thing, because I know we're going to talk about most of my questions today are going to focus on thyroid and iodine. I'm going to go down that rabbit hole, which I feel like is definitely one of your big rabbit holes. But since you had asthma, I don't see asthma and I've got half of your books, but I don't think there's an asthma book, but you had asthma. No, no asthma book for me. No, that actually could be a book. I never thought about that. Oh, and, well, time, know, time to get it. Me. We're busy. You know what? People ask me about how do you write all those books? Or how does it come to you to write those books? It comes to me, just comes to me. Like I don't have any master plan. And you know, I have to, when I'm writing a book, it's either I am excited about something or I'm irritated about something. It's one of those two things <laughs> that it gives me the passion to write a book. So okay. I never thought about writing about asthma. And you know, one of the reasons I don't think about it is my asthma is gone. Maybe not 100% gone, but it is 99.99% gone. And I used to be on medicine and inhalers and ER visits. And it was serious. I, I really, I thought for the beginning part of my life, that's how I was going to die. I, I was sure I was going to die. 
from uh, strangulation from asthma. And man, I was really bad. You know, it was well, a severe case of asthma. Don't leave us hanging like that. You know, we had this really lovely story about your dad, which was great because I'm also waiting for that call. But since your asthma is gone, why don't you tell us about how, you, why your asthma is gone? And then we'll jump into thyroid and iodine. I think there's a book in there. So my asthma is gone. So. so I was always an athlete. I played tennis and I swam, you know, in high school. And then you know, I had offers with me everywhere and steroids and all this stuff. I mean, it was, so I started getting into holistic medicine after my dad. And, you know, from that moment on, every person gets a hormonal and nutritional evaluation, a whole hormonal mm-hmm. evaluation and a nutritional evaluation. So I started looking at myself and I start drawing blood tests on myself. And I find, you know, the same thing as my dad, I've got this low thyroid hormone level. I got all these nutritional deficits and lo and behold, through blood testing and IgG analysis, I find I got a casein sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Casein is the major protein in dairy products. I never really liked dairy products. You know, I -hmm. I always, I I hated drinking milk and I hated cheese and I just hate dairy products. But, you know, growing up in the seventies, I started my day with cereal and milk Mm -hmm. and I probably, I've got dairy, I'm sure in many sources that I just, just didn't actively go for it. Mm -hmm. So Really, once I cleaned up my diet, and it wasn't just dairy, you know, once I cleaned up my diet of that and refined sugars and eating better and then correcting nutritional imbalances, it as much as melted away. And I still find today, if I indulge in something that I shouldn't, I start wheezing a little bit. And that's where maybe it's not 100% gone, but it's, you know, I don't have inhalers at the handy anymore. And I don't, I play tennis, active, vigorous tennis three or four days a week. I don't use inhalers for that. So it's it's nearly gone from just cleaning up my environment, cleaning up, you know, detoxing and just doing the, what I call the basic things, eating better. Drinking water is a big part of asthma, you know, hydrating. I mean, that, that was my story with it. Yeah, cool. So you have a thyroid story. Part of the reason you're here is because I was getting really frustrated with people that felt like they had thyroid issues and they looked like they had thyroid issues, but their blood test didn't look like they had thyroid issues or their doctor didn't say that they had thyroid issues. So we'll get into that. But since we're talking about asthma and you did this testing, et cetera, I have your thyroid book right here where it says fibromyalgia and other conditions as well as just thyroid. How often, because I see, I like to look at common denominators of how everything is working. And we usually just put like kind of a label on the top of what's actually happening underneath. How often do you see thyroid issues as cofactors or as root causes of other diagnoses or labels that people have, would you say? That's a good question, Krista. So let's take the first 10 years of my practice. So here I treat my dad. I leave that conventional practice, get in my own office, and I start just practicing holistic medicine and learning learning the craft. Mm-hmm. So I find 10 years later, got a busy practice at that point. I'm happy, think I'm helping people and doing what I'm doing and doing treating the underlying causes of their problems and so on and so on. And I would estimate at that time, I had two thirds of my practice on thyroid hormone. And in med school, I was taught to check a thyroid stimulating hormone level, the TSH level. TSH is a hormone from the pituitary gland of the brain that is released and goes into the bloodstream and stimulates the thyroid gland, the pituitary gland up here, thyroid gland here to produce thyroid hormone. So when you don't have enough thyroid circulating in your body, your body sends a signal to the pituitary mm-hmm. to release more TSH. So TSH will go up. So you're really looking for an elevated TSH. That's how I was taught it. Then they need thyroid hormone. So it's a simplistic way to do it, but you know, and it's not a comprehensive way to do it. So what I do now is I check TSH levels. I still, still do that, but I check free T3 and free T4, the inactive and active thyroid hormone levels produced here in the thyroid gland. And I check reverse T3 levels and I do thyroid antibody levels on everybody. And so with doing that comprehensive panel, you pick up many more patients who have low thyroid function that you can help. And so hypothyroidism, you know, I wrote a book on it. It's called Hypothyroidism. Overcoming Thyroid Disorders. Is that what you're talking about? That's it. Overcoming Thyroid Disorders. And I don't just rely on blood tests. I'm treating people instead of blood tests. So one of the other things you can check are basal body with our first morning temperature before you get up. And if those are low, that's indicative perhaps of not producing enough thyroid hormone. So you put that whole picture together with doing a good history and a good physical exam and a lab test, a comprehensive lab test. And then, you know, you can make a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. So in the first 10 years of my practice, I probably, I would estimate I had 75% of my patients on thyroid hormone. And I would also estimate my average thyroid hormone dose was two grains or 120 milligrams of natural thyroid hormone. 
at that point in my career, you know, I'm reading and I'm learning, and I'm going to conference after conference. And it was bothering me why so many of my patients were on thyroid hormone to feel good. Because most patients, when they went on thyroid hormone, felt better. You know, they have the aches and pains and fibromyalgia or brain fog or something or cold or fatigue. And you give them a little thyroid hormone, those symptoms get better. So they were feeling better. I thought I was doing the right thing for them. And really, there was two sort of trains that collided at once there. There were in this 10-year period, there were two studies that came out that showed the longer that women took thyroid hormone, the higher the risk of breast cancer was. Mm. So that one of the studies compared women never on thyroid hormone with women who took thyroid hormone and their breast cancer risk was, I don't have the exact numbers in my head, but it was like 30% higher chance of breast cancer if you were taking thyroid hormone. The other study looked at the length of time you were on thyroid hormone. And if you were on thyroid hormone over 10 years, your risk of breast cancer went up 50% over those who didn't take thyroid hormone. Now, I'm pretty good at looking at studies and I'm pretty good about dissecting them. I'm pretty good about statistics. And I teach doctors how to do functional medical statistics. And those were two good studies. And I, you know, so it was bugging me like what's, I was taught holistically that, and in conventional worlds that breast cancer goes up if you're hypothyroid, if you're not in. So here, one thing that being hypothyroid increases risk of breast cancer. And, and remember, breast cancer affects one in seven women across the United States. And you know, it's a, it's a national disaster. So on one hand, I'm being taught that hypothyroidism increases your risk for breast cancer. On the other hand, you treat hypothyroidism with thyroid hormone, that increases your risk of breast cancer. And the longer you take it, risk goes up 50%. Well, mm. those two studies were out there before this 10-year period was up. It always bothered me. I tried to dissect those studies in, in a negative way and tear them apart, and I couldn't do it. And then over that 10-year period, I, you know, I'm prescribing thyroid hormone after thyroid hormone after thyroid hormone. People were getting better. There were very little side effects, you know, couldn't be managed by adjusting the dosage. But, I, you know, I thought, come on, we can't be designed by our maker just because we're getting a little bit older that we all need thyroid hormone or three quarters, mm -hmm. of, us, three quarters of us need thyroid hormone to feel good. Mm -hmm. So I would look at the cofactors. And one of the things I learned from Dr. Radke and functional biochemistry was how do you support the human physiology, the human biochemical pathways? You give them the right nutrients they need and you give it the right fuel. And we were designed pretty well to function healthy and good brain function, good energy into old age, really old age, if the body has the basic raw materials it needs. So the biochemical pathways need raw materials like vitamins and minerals and fatty acids and things. So I would look at the thyroid biochemical pathways and in those pathways would be things like selenium and magnesium and zinc. And, you know, I was checking those levels on people as well. And then I really started focusing on how does the thyroid gland make thyroid hormone and how do you optimize that? So I would try all those cofactors. And one of the major cofactors was iodine. The highest concentration of iodine in the human body is in the thyroid gland. The second highest concentration of women is in the breast tissue. The next highest concentration is in the ovaries and the prostate and the uterus, all the glandular tissues. So that includes the breast, ovaries, uterus, prostate, pancreas, thyroid. All contains huge amounts of iodine. In fact, we're, we're so well set up to get iodine, we have this really unique mechanism where we have a, a it's called a symporter that can transport iodine from the bloodstream into these glands against a gradient. So it takes an energy molecule, ATP, to do that. And the reason for that is because humans have learned to adapt and survive in low iodine environments. You know, I would look at selenium, I'd look at zinc, I'd look at vitamin A, whatever, for the thyroid. And I really look at iodine because the highest concentration of iodine in the body is in the thyroid gland, and you can't make thyroid hormone without iodine. And I knew where I lived in the Great Lakes area, those border the Great Lakes, which is Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and Ontario province in Canada, you know, on the other side of the Great Lakes. Our soil is one of the most iodine deficient areas of the entire world. It's been known for over 100 years. So I would try these cofactors and I would try iodine. Nothing worked great. Now, people didn't get sick from any of this stuff. And in regards to iodine, I would try low doses. I try medium doses. I try high doses. I didn't see any big negative effects mm -hmm. from any of that stuff and negative effects from iodine, but I still had to use thyroid hormone. They just, I, they couldn't feel as good as when they were in thyroid hormone. So in one of my medical journals, a researcher wrote an article about how he developed an iodine loading test. Mm -hmm. Now, at that point in my career, this is 10 years now into holistic medicine, there was no good iodine testing in any lab and across the U.S. And so I was just guessing that people were low in iodine. 
So I called him after that. His name was Dr. Guy Abraham. He was a researcher in California. He developed this iodine loading test. He sent me some research articles. He explained the test to me. I started, I read his research articles, thought he was really on to something with his testing. And he became interested in my practice because I was in the Great Lakes area with low iodine in the soil. And mm. he knew that. And so he said, let's do a study together. And so I sent him, I started collecting urine samples for my patients and collated them and kept them and you know, sent them over to California. And then I was flying out to California once a month and him and I would get in the lab, his lab, and we'd do the measurements. And Dr. Abraham taught me more about iodine than he'll ever know. He, he was one of the smartest doctors I've ever, smartest human beings I've ever met in my life. And lo and behold, you know, over 95% of my patients are low in iodine. They're not only low, they are miserably low. And it was consistent patient to patient. The only people that weren't low in iodine were the ones taking it on their own. So Dr. Abraham taught me about iodine. I was prescribing the wrong kind of iodine. Once I learned about iodine, you know, um, and prescribed the right kind of iodine, which is a mixture of iodine and iodide, the oxidized and reduced form of iodine, everything started to gel and everything worked. And what I found was when I started using the right form of iodine, now all of a sudden patients who were on thyroid hormone, about half of them didn't even need it or more. Mm -hmm. And the other half needed less. So I went from having 75% of my patients, I mean, on thyroid hormone, the first 10 years of my practice to maybe a quarter it's less than that. It's a, it's a third of patients to a quarter of patients who are on thyroid hormone. And of those still on thyroid hormone, my average dose now is 30 milligrams instead of 120. And they're all in iodine. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a book on that. I think I have that. It's, I didn't know uh, that was the second one, second book. Yeah, that was my first book of yours. That was the third book. Okay, third book. Third book. So i not irritated in iodine. I was excited about iodine. That's not that <laughs> out there. And yeah. You know, it's transformed my practice. So, if, if, you know, I always say if the government came to me, and unfortunately they have come to me since mm -hmm. COVID has started, and they said to me, you know, we don't like your practice, which that kind of happened mm -hmm. or was hinted at. But if they said to me, you know what, we're not going to let you do what you were doing before, but we'll give you one thing to take mm -hmm. with you from the holistic world. You pick one. This is what I would pick out mm -hmm. of everything. This, that iodine is the biggest bang for the buck. It helps so many people, and it's really the neatest thing I've seen in 30 years of practicing holistic medicine. I've got a lot of iodine questions coming at you, but first, since you had to change the form of iodine to iodine and iodide, did you also have to change the dose? Because you had said you were giving them iodine before, but you weren't seeing a difference, so you changed the type, but you also have to change the dose. So what I was using first was iodide, the ID, mm -hmm. reduced form of iodine, mm -hmm. and I was using small doses, medium doses, large doses. It never worked. Mm. People didn't get, there was no side effects that I can recall, or, you know, maybe here and there, everyone, everyone can have a side effect, uh, something, but there was no mess problems with it. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was very rare. There were side effects with it, but nobody felt better. And I wasn't lowering thyroid hormone levels. When I used a combination of iodine and iodide, and when this was really Dr. Abraham introduced me to this work, there was some old literature that showed different tissues of the body, primarily buying different forms of iodine. The thyroid gland iodide, the reduced form. Now, that's the kind I was using, and you would think that would help the thyroid. It just didn't work till there was iodine in there. Iodine, the oxidized form, binds to the breast tissue. And the stomach, the thyroid, the ovaries, uterus, different tissues bind different forms of iodine. But when I lecture to doctors, I always say to them, if you want a whole body effect for iodine, it's best to use a common. What I do is I present a series of slides showing these different tissues of the body and what they preferentially take up. And then I said, well, what's the best form of iodine? And the next slide is, it's a combination of iodine and iodide to take care of the whole body. That's a whole body way to, to supplement with. Since I was using small, medium, and large doses of iodide, I would say I would do the same thing with iodine and iodide. And these are milligram doses, so they're considered large by maybe conventional medicine. But in the holistic world, these are the physiologic doses that are needed to help people. And, you know, I talked to a lady earlier today who's got this breast lump that we're dealing with that we're not sure, you know, what it is. You know, I told her there's an iodine deficiency continuum out there where if I call this normal iodine, so if you have normal iodine, you have normal architecture of the glandular tissue, the thyroid, ovaries, uterus, breast, prostate, pancreas. And think about it. One in seven women have breast cancer across the U.S. One in three men have prostate cancer. We all know people with pancreatic cancer these days. When I was in residency 30 years ago, the only people who got pancreatic cancer were alcoholics and old people. And we all know young people now dying or dead or sick 
were diagnosed recently with pancreatic cancer, ovarian, uterine, thyroid, ovaries, uterus, breast, prostate, pancreas. I think I got them all, all going at, at increased rates, you know, epidemic rates right now. And I say it's in large part from iodine deficiency. So if this is normal architecture of the glands, then there's no cysts, there's no nodules, there's no disruption of the architecture. It's normal. How we want, how we designed by our maker to have. And iodine deficiency, the first thing that happens is you get cysts in these tissues. If it goes on longer, the cysts become hard and nodular. If it goes on longer, they take a hyperplastic appearance. If you biopsy them, look at them under a microscope, that's the precursor to cancer. This continuum has been shown in the animal test tube in humans for iodine deficiency. And in animal test tube in human studies, they've shown iodine has been able to halt and many times reverse this back to normal. So I've treated lots of people with cysts and nodules and hyperplasia and even cancer of thyroid, ovaries, uterus, breast, prostate, pancreas with iodine. And you've got to use higher dose therapies in this. And I talk about that in my book that you know, it helps their situation dramatically, mm -hmm. sometimes dramatically. Maybe there's a cancer book here too. If you weren't on the old spot list, you would be after that. Anyway, we'll keep going. This would be a good thing to make sure we throw in here because if people listen to this and say, I'm going to try iodine, let's talk about why iodine increases TSH and how long someone has to go off of iodine so it doesn't influence TSH serum testing. So when someone's iodine deficient, the thyroid gland will slow itself down because it's unable to make thyroid hormones. So it still might be in the reference range if this is the upper and lower limb of the reference range, but in the lower part. And they, you know, physiologically won't feel well. You know, they're tired or fatigued or brain fogged or achy or fibromyalgia diagnosis or something like mm -hmm. that. So this is a whole biochemical mechanism. I have a whole, I have two chapters on this in the iodine book. And this is an hour lecture to healthcare professionals mm -hmm. on this. But when you give someone iodine who's low in iodine, they don't have these symporters. And these symporters are they're like taxi cabs that take iodine from the bloodstream and move it into the thyroid gland or the breasts or the ovaries or the prostate or pancreas or the uterus or wherever it's supposed to go. And we're not designed stupidly, it's not a word, stupidly. We're not designed poorly that we're going to have these taxi cabs just idling mm. for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, waiting for an iodine molecule to come so it can move it across into the thyroid gland or the other glandular tissue. So we stop producing these taxi cabs or these symporter molecules when there's no iodine. And so when you give someone iodine, you need taxi cabs, you need symporter molecules to be able to move it into the cell and to be utilized. So the stimulus to make the taxi cabs to get the production going is TSH. So one of the first things that happens when you give someone who's iodine deficient iodine, their TSH goes up and it goes up above the reference range. You know, the reference range for TSH on the upper part is four, four and a half, something like that. It, it goes up six, 12, 15, occasionally in the 20s, you know, usually not higher than that. And what that TSH is doing is it's like you're stimulating the symporter factory to make symporters so you can move the iodine in. That takes about four to six months or the length of time so the tissues become saturated with iodine, which is three to six months, four to six months. And then once that happens, the TSH comes back down. So the answer to your question is one of the first things that happens when someone goes on iodine that can make somebody concerned who doesn't understand this is TSH will go up. Now, a conventional doctor who has no knowledge of this will say, oh, you're, you become hypothyroid. It's iodine-induced hypothyroidism, IIH. Mm. If you check their T3 and T4 levels, they're normal. If you check a reverse T3 levels, those are pretty good. If you do a physical exam, they have normal reflexes. Their heart rate's fine. They're not hypothyroid. They're not hyperthyroid. And if you ask them, how do you feel? They'll generally tell you, man, I feel better. Sleeping better. I'm thinking better. I'm exercising better. I'm, my body feels better. And they just need time to get iodine into their glandular tissue before that TSH comes back down. And so what I tell people is, look, I don't suggest anyone go take iodine alone. Just, you know, go buy it and take it. You should work with an iodine literate healthcare professional who can help guide you. And you should have your levels checked before and after. And you should just, you know, it's best not to be your own doctor and to, to work with someone and educate yourself. Well, one of the main reasons I started writing my books was I was spending too much time, especially since I was going against the grain, explaining why you need to use bioidentical natural hormones, why the synthetic hormones aren't good, why the thyroid reference range is too large. It should be like this instead of like this. And so I would, I wrote the book really for my patients so they could understand, you know, my thought process of what I was doing. So I suggest educate yourself. So you 
so you understand the whole concept of it. And the more knowledgeable the patients are, the better outcomes they have. Absolutely. Do you have them go off of iodine if they're going to do a blood test for including TSH? No, I haven't taken iodine if I'm going to do t- thyroid testing. I haven't go off iodine for two or three days if I'm going to do iodine testing and see where they're at because there's a carryover effect and you know, there's no conventional test for once you're taking iodine. The only tests you have conventionally for iodine are iodine deficiencies since whole countries are iodine deficient once they're taking iodine. And the iodine deficiency epidemics of our country has gotten worse over the last few decades, you know, because our food supply with iodine has gone down and our exposure to chemicals that knock iodine out of the body, they're known as halogens, you know, toxic halogens, bromide and fluoride in particular, have gone way up over the last 30, 40 years. And so our generation and our generations who are alive now are much more iodine deficient than our predecessors were 30, 40 and, and longer. You know, the iodine deficiency problem has just gotten worse, even though we iodized salt in the 1920s. Now, that's that's enough iodine and salt to prevent swelling of the thyroid in the vast majority of people who are exposed to it, but it's not enough for a whole body iodine sufficiency, not even close. Mm-hmm. Speaking of iodine testing, is the iodine loading, urine loading test 24 hours still your preference? Because there are some people who talk about, well, you can get good information from doing a morning spot test. You can get good information from a morning spot test if you're not taking iodine, period. That's it. So if you're taking iodine, the morning spot test doesn't work because we don't have reference ranges for that. And so if you're taking iodine, the only test available is Dr. Abraham's test, the iodine loading test. Mm-hmm. And he should get a Nobel Prize for that. It was it was really you know genius work. I spend a lot of time talking about that in my book. So the spot test is really just for people who are not taking iodine. If you're taking iodine, it's, it's useless. When I was doing a urine loading test on everyone, everyone was deficient. And you've said similar, (laughs) similar statements in your book. Is there anyone who doesn't need iodine or you just have them all do an iodine loading test? And, or do people, I think we know the answer to this based on what you just said, but people ask this all the time. Do you ever go off iodine? Once they start reading your book, they say, I don't think you ever go off iodine. So so iodine is an essential element. We can't live without it. We can't manufacture it. So we have to get it from our diet or we supplement with it. If we don't, we're deficient. Now, our maker must have designed us, or we've adapted either one of the two, or both, probably both in combination with one another, that we have been able to adapt to low iodine environments. And we can live, we don't live very well, low iodine environments. You know, we suffer with breast cancer, prostate cancer, and ovarian cancer, and uterine cancer, and pancreatic cancer, and heart disease is part of this too. You know, all the big killers in the US. So do you ever go off it? If you go off it and you don't get enough from your diet, you will be iodine deficient in 48 hours after you go off it. Mm -hmm. So the answer, the other part of that answer is our exposure to fluoride and bromide is ubiquitous and enormous and ongoing, and it never lets up. And that kicks out iodine in the body. And that's a constant pushback against getting iodine in the body. That effect will take effect if you stop iodine. So, you know, I don't like to say once you start it, you're on it forever, but really, in our world, our modern world, once you started to run it forever, our food supply just simply does not supply enough iodine to combat the amount of toxic halogens we get in our diet, uh, we get in our environment and our diet. I had the iodine urine loading test in my bathroom that I was kicking around for months before I did it. And then after I did it, you take a 50 milligram tab of iodine. And for the few days after, I was like, I am so smart and focused and able to concentrate and get so much work done. Like, what the hell did I do? I got to make sure I do that again. Oh my gosh, I took a 50 milligram tab of iodine. And at that moment, I had this aha moment that I thought that I must have just had like a little bit of ADHD, but really I just had a sluggish thyroid and was low in iodine. And now I can't look around people that say they have ADHD without assessing all of their thyroid symptoms for it. It feels ridiculous. So that was my iodine story. I there's, been a couple, there's been a couple of ADD studies showing that there's a strong correlation of ADD and thyroid problems and low iodine. And, you know, I had, I had that same effect you had when I did that 50 milligram loading test. I'm like, holy moly, got all the energy in the world. And I was dreaming again. And I remember I was so focused and, you know, of course, that excitement period settled down. I, I still have, I have more energy than I had, I think, when I was 18 years old. And I'm focused. I can, you know, I can see a load of patients during the day. I can come home and do two hours of work on the computer and catch up on my emails and listen to all the nonsense about COVID that's out there and try and 
digest it and put it together. And, you know, I still do it. And I think that, again, that's why I said to you at the beginning, the government said you only get one thing to take with you holistically. Otherwise, start prescribing all the drugs we taught you again. It'd be iodine. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you a few more questions about iodine in different situations, and we'll kind of get into some of these rapid fire questions that I got from different people. So since we just talked about ADD, it brought up the idea of kids and thyroid and kids and iodine and kids. Do you have anything you want to say about that? If we're deficient in iodine, our kids are deficient in iodine. There are multiple studies showing if a woman who delivers a baby is deficient in iodine, baby's IQ can drop from five to 15 points. We think that's a permanent drop. So you you could have a kid that him or her can't meet their potential in life because they were in an iodine and deficient incubator, you know, and in, in their mother. So this this issue needs to be addressed before women are pregnant. However, that's not the case with a lot of people. And what I found is that kids with ADD, kids who have concentration problems, which Lord knows, man, that's way out. That wasn't there when I was a kid, but mm-hmm. it's certainly there now. They do improve when they correct nutritional. Look, iodine shouldn't be used as a sole treatment for everything. It should be part of a holistic treatment regimen, diet and nutrition and detox and you know rehydration and things. But iodine itself has has really dramatic effects on both young people and, and old people and middle people as well. And I've seen kids with ADD; they're, they're get markedly better. You know, it's a holistic treatment regimen, but you know, markedly better really when iodine's added in. You talk about there's another subset of the population, which is pregnant women. And you briefly talk about this in the book and you talk about what happens in Japan. But people ask this question all the time. Talk to us about iodine supplementation during pregnancy. So in Japan, Dr. Abraham and I did that work. It's estimated they ingest 100 times the iodine daily than we do in the U.S. And the U.S. RDA for iodine is set on, you know, what's the minimal amount of iodine in the diet to prevent goiter, swelling of the thyroid. It's not the optimal amount of iodine. It's not what's the best amount of iodine to prevent thyroid cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, to help with ADD or whatever, IQ, you know, for, it's to prevent goiter of the thyroid. So that minimal amount the, the, is 150 micrograms. The, the doses I'm talking about for people are generally 25 to 50 milligrams if you don't have glandular problems. And if you have glandular problems, more than that. So I'm talking at least 100 times the RDA for iodine. And the Japanese ingest on a daily basis because they use seaweed and in a large part of their diet, and they also fertilize their crops with seaweed. And the major source of iodine on the planet Earth is in the oceans. Now, that iodine level has gone down because of our pollution of the oceans, but it's still there. So it's estimated the Japanese have, you know, 100 times more just in their diet than we do. And that could be the explanation of why the Japanese have markedly lower rates of breast cancer, prostate cancer, ovarian cancer, you, you know, down the line compared to us. Hmm. I recommend clients adjust iodine levels based on symptom assessment primarily. Do you have any thoughts about when you start people and how you adjust or come back down? Again, I would say work with a literate healthcare practitioner with iodine who can just help mm-hmm. you with this. And look, I have a lot of patients I do that with too. I'm not certainly not going to lie about that. I would tell you, I start most of my patients at 25 milligrams and I'm very liberal with my patients about particularly if they have cystic breasts or cystic ovaries or prostate enlargements or pancreatic problems or, you know, same glandular problems I've been harping on. I'm very liberal about, hey, you know, if you want to try more, let's see how you do with it. If they have cancer of those tissues, I'll generally start at more than 50 milligrams. And, you know, I follow them. And, you know, iodine, there are some people that get side effects from taking iodine. There's some people get side effects from taking vitamin C. There's I got people complain about drinking water when I tell them to drink more water. So you can have a side effect from anything, but those are rare when it's used mm-hmm. appropriately. I've only had a couple of people react pretty negatively. Otherwise it's like a few days of fatigue. I had one person recently who said, I've been fatigued ever since I started this. So then we just reevaluate cofactors, salt loading, et cetera. Mm-hmm. The one person who was my daughter, which was fun, but she's just like, oh, I feel like I got hit by a car, like whatever. I said, you could start this topically. Any other comments about negative reactions? That's kind of my well, approach is like, go back to cofactors, go back to salt loading, all the things. There's no more negative reactions in any single patient than doctors, family members, particularly <laughs> their wives or their husbands, <laughs> female or male. It doesn't matter. You know, of course, they are the worst. Yeah. I do this whole part of my item lecture on this. So my friend who uh, I went to med school with called me up and says, you got to see so-and-so. She's 
diagnosed with Graves' disease. She's miserable. They're going to mm. they're going to give her radioactive iodine, and I don't want her to take that, but I don't know what to give her. And you know, can you see her? And I hadn't heard from him since med school, so I see her. She's got a goiter, and she's got the big Graves' eyes, and she's. Uh, I check her iodine levels; they're near zero, and you know, put her in iodine, and that's how I treat Graves' disease and Hashimoto's disease. And I was taught in med school that. Iodine can make those, iodine's what causes those situations. Well, that's not true. Mm -hmm. Iodine levels have fallen over 50% over the last 50 years across the U.S. and Graves and Hashimoto's has gone through the roof. That disproves that. And anyone who says that is talking nonsense. So I put her on iodine as part of a holistic treatment regimen. And you never use iodine alone without salt. The salt has a huge positive effect with iodine and can sometimes get rid of those negative reactions like what your daughter has because salt helps you to chelate and bind those Helps those halides, those toxic halides, fluoride and bromide come out. So maybe you're, she's feeling lousy because she mobilized bromide and fluoride when she took iodine. Salt will help minimize that. So I see her, put her on iodine. He calls me up. He goes, oh, I don't know. She's already sick from Graves' disease. Isn't that going to make her worse? I'm like, trust me. So I put her on iodine and she's scheduled for this eye surgery because her eyes were bulging out of her head, which happens in Graves' disease. And she feels better immediately. Her thyroid calms down. She cancels the radioactive iodine treatment. She cancels the thyroid eye surgery she's going to have done. And I get a letter from the ophthalmologist. And I, when I lecture about this, I have the letter in there. And in the letter, he says something like, you know, what I originally thought was uh, pro-optosis from, from Graves' disease is not because she's better. And I think it was from Graves' disease. So her Graves' disease was better, which is what happened. Mm -hmm. And he goes, right now she doesn't need surgery. And if things go this way, she'll never need surgery for eyes. And I, he wrote it a little more medically than that. But I show the letter. And at the end of the letter, I always say, especially when I'm lecturing to healthcare practitioners, this was a doctor's wife. And if this can work on a doctor's wife, it can work on anybody because they're the worst patients. And they, mm -hmm. the problems, they have the side effects, nothing works for them. And so anyways, try the salt with your daughter and see if that helps. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Here's some questions that have come up for people. So these are kind of interesting ones. Let me start with the breast cancer and iodine status one. Can you discuss or cover iodine deficiencies connection to an increase in estrogen production and increased sensitivity of breast tissue to estrogen in your book? Yes, you noted, okay. In your book, you noted iodine, iodide therapy could enhance the efficacy of tamoxifen therapy, thus preventing or slowing the development of tamoxifen resistance. So what do you want to say about oh, this? iodine has 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 intricate mechanisms to help with estrogen metabolism and an iodine deficiency estrogens may hang around a lot longer and stimulate and stimulate and stimulate perhaps that's one of the reasons especially with our exposure to xenoestrogens which are estrogen mimics in the environment that hang around forever because people don't have enough iodine to get their detox pathways going to get mm -hmm. rid of it and maybe that's what's causing i mean i don't have to tell you and i don't tell any of the listeners here breast size has increased dramatically over the last few decades. And younger girls now are larger than their mothers and mothers are larger than their grandmother than their mothers. And, you know, girls are developing breasts at earlier age and larger breasts. And it's, it's a problem. I mean, it's too much breast tissue and you've got more breast tissue and less iodine. You got more problems for hyperplasia and, and, you know, abnormal cells to grow and things like that. So our predecessors had iodine levels and lesser exposure to the toxic allergens than we do now. And I think that's what's in part driving, you know, this larger breast size in women, which I don't think is a good thing. You know, and so iodine does help with estrogen metabolism. And the answer was yes to both parts of those questions. I remember the second part. It was just, can you talk about iodine deficiency connection and increase to estrogen production and increase sensitivity in breast tissue to estrogen? Yeah, it's basically the same, basically what I just said. Mm -hmm. On this note, I think this might actually cover this one. I had someone with perimenopause rubbing iodine on her breast. She hadn't had a menstrual cycle for several months. And two days later, she had a menstrual cycle. So in perimenopause, we're having a decrease of both of those hormones. And so... I'm wondering if it's really the same mechanism that would be possibly happening where you would be able to have a cycle if you're using iodine, either topically or orally. You can rub iodine in the skin and absorb it topically, although it's not an efficient mechanism. The most efficient way to take iodine is orally. So, you know, I have had women rub it on them, or men. There's an old iodine test where you rub iodine, the oxidized form mm -hmm. on your skin, and it's brown, and you look for how long it takes the brown color to go away, and you assume the brown color goes away within 24 hours, it's a really deficient in iodine. Well, there was another study that showed 80% of that rub on the skin sublimates into a gas and just goes into the environment. 
Mm-hmm. So that's not the best way to test for iodine, but you can get some iodine in through the skin and you will get some effect. And let, let me tell you, if someone is super low in iodine, you put some on the skin, they're going to, their hormones will shift and they will feel it. And, you know, that certainly can bring out a period. Mm. All right. Here's one kind of moving a little bit away from iodine. Can you talk about what happened with nature thyroid or nature thyroid? And I'm going to give a little more context because people will say, I was on nature thyroid. I felt really good. Then I went on armor and didn't feel good. And now I'm on synthroid and levothyrox and I feel really terrible. So there's some version of this story that's really common in a lot of people, anyone who's medicated, and this makes it a little more complex. Can you talk to us about, I'm guessing this is in the natural hormones book that's on my shelf a little bit, but do you want to talk a little bit about why medication for thyroid issues gets really convoluted for people? So I got the same issues in my practice. And so let's go back to the first 10 years of my practice. No one's on iodine and three quarters are on thyroid hormone. The second 10 years and beyond, I'm on to the just finished, or I'm in my 30th year right now, I have less than 25% on thyroid hormone and are on a, a dose of a quarter of what they were on average of what they were on before. And that's the iodine effect of that. So nature thyroid was a natural desiccated thyroid hormone. We also found really effective in our practice and we were using a lot of it. And just as the FDA has done to all the other thyroid manufacturers from the synthetic ones like Synthroid, Levothyroid, all of them, including Armour Thyroid, they found a batch, I don't remember how many batches, it was one or two batches of Nature Thyroid were just below the lower limit of the 95% confidence interval lower limit. So I talked to the owners who manufacture Nature Thyroid. I mean, I talked to them about this when this happened. This is my take on the story with it. The FDA mandated them recall those batches and it was a voluntary recall. I could tell you from seeing enough patients and we check thyroid hormone levels and everyone, we know in our practice when there's a problem. I know when there's a problem with a lab test and I know when there's a problem with thyroid hormone or DHA or pregnenolone or those are two adrenal hormones, things that I can test for. I know when there's a problem. I know it really early. My partners see it really early. We've commented on this for years. Something's wrong with either the testing or the medication. And over the years, every thyroid manufacturer has had recalls of their thyroid products because they've been suboptimal, falling below this 95% level that the FDA says they shouldn't fall below. And I'm not a biochemist making thyroid hormone, so I'm, I'm, but there must be some stability problem with thyroid hormone. Doesn't matter synthetic, doesn't matter if it's natural desiccated thyroid hormone that's there. So I've seen it for 30 years. So somehow the FDA and the makers of Nature Thyroid, RLC, got into a, a, I'll say a nice word, an argument. You know, they were disagreeing with one another. And I heard about this from the RLC side of things. And the FDA basically shut them down where they didn't shut down the other manufacturers. And I think this was, I don't know, I kind of felt like it was more of just a, they got pissed for lack of a better word over this and shut them down. And we haven't had Nature Thyroid for, I don't know, two or three years now. I don't remember when they did it. And Patients have suffered. No question, patients have suffered. Now, interestingly, in those batches that, that the FDA said were suboptimal, we never saw the changes in the lab test. Never saw it. And the RLC people told me they had independently, because you have to keep a certain amount of a batch separate. If this happens where you the FDA can test them, they sent some samples for testing and they didn't find that was the case. They didn't believe it was suboptimal, but they were shut down. And the other interesting thing was at the time they were shut down, They were the cheapest thyroid manufacturer out there by far. Their products were, I don't know, a third of the price. I'm not, I don't know exactly, but they were really cheap thyroid hormone products. As soon as they shut down, the thyroid products jacked up. And it's ridiculous now how much thyroid hormone costs. How have you managed without this for the last three years? Well, okay. So I was hoping you were going to ask that because I was going to say whether you asked asked it or not. First 10 years of my practice, no iodine, around 120 milligrams of thyroid hormone. The next 20 years you're on 30 milligrams of thyroid hormone with iodine. What I found in the last 20 years, if you read my thyroid book and even my iodine book, I write in there that the natural thyroid hormone is genuinely a better choice than the synthetic thyroid hormone. And I give a biochemical explanation why, because it's more closely mimics the human physiology. That's all true. However, what I found when I started using iodine, it didn't seem to matter so much what brand of thyroid hormone they were on, where it seemed to matter the first 10 years a lot. And so whether they were on synthetic thyroid hormone like Synthroid or Levothyroid, or they were on desiccated thyroid hormone. The difference in how people felt and how they responded to it 
was much less once they were on iodine. And I really couldn't see the difference in the vast majority of people. So how did I get around it? They were already on iodine. For most of my patients, it wasn't that big of a deal to shift them to whatever. And I think that's why we didn't really run into huge problems with it. I had the occasional patient, certainly did better on the nature thyroid than anything else out there. They were few and far between. Mm, That's really reassuring. So this is good. Thanks for sharing that. I think this is probably a pretty good one to talk about before we all see how many more questions you really want to answer here. (laughs) So you say in the book, increasing the metabolism of the body with thyroid hormone. So basically if the thyroid hormone gets stimulated or the the metabolism upregulates, that can really overload poorly functioning adrenal glands and just make things worse. I think that I talk to people about this all the time, how important that your thyroid will never work well if your adrenals are not wanting to work well. Is this a factor in, hey, I gave someone iodine, I gave someone thyroid stuff, and they're still not in good shape. Do you then go look at adrenal function? Well, you do off the bat. I know you do because you're looking at their hormone levels. Yeah, but I look at it more. That's that's a good question. But I always say the thyroid and adrenals are like a Mm teeter-totter. You want them in balance. So Thyroid is kind of like you're in a car and you step on the gas and the, you know, the gas is the giving the engine more gas to burn is the thyroid and the car moves down the road. The adrenals are kind of like the um, transmission. So if the transmission doesn't engage, you can step on the gas, give more thyroid hormone. The engine will rev, 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 but the car won't move until the car burns out. Same thing happens with people. If you give them thyroid hormone, the adrenals aren't balanced. They they don't like it. They Mm -hmm. get palpitations, fast heart rate, headaches, Mm -hmm. they they don't feel good. So if they're not doing well on it, I do absolutely what you just said. I step back, relook at the adrenal glands and make sure they have enough adrenal hormone to help this situation work appropriately. And unfortunately, what you just said is not commonplace. We don't really recognize adrenal issues unless you're basically dead. I talk about that a lot. You know, the reason, here's the reason I started writing books in 1998. First book I wrote was A Miracle of Natural Hormones. For this very thing we're talking about. So I would have to sit and explain this to patients and they just couldn't get adrenal and thyroid. They didn't know the words. And, you know, so I wrote chapters on all this and how it all works together. And I tell, you know, I wanted them to be on board with me, but once they understand it, once they can talk about it, they're better patients. They, right. and they have a better, they have a better outcome. There's no question. Once you understand it, that's why this topic is why I wrote, started writing books. Right. And probably now you, and for sure, this is my clientele. They're pretty much not going to work with me if they don't want to understand everything anyway. But yeah, unfortunately, right. people, that leaves people are gonna, that leaves everyone else out. <laughs> you know, you have to decide that you want to understand everything. All right. Here is a couple of quick questions. We'll see. And uh, you can just cut me off whenever you're ready here. Someone asked, is there any risk of the iodine loading test of the 50 milligrams? There's always a risk. I mean, you know, who can predict some kind of anaphylactic reaction? Having said that, I haven't had that happen. Mm-hmm. I've had people react negatively to iodine. It's not 100% restricted, but it's mostly restricted people with what's called an autonomously functioning nodule. They have a nodule in their thyroid gland that's lost cold. The body can't control it anymore. So when you give them iodine, they take it up real fast and make a lot of thyroid hormone. They become hyperthyroid, nervous, jittery, palpitations, tachycardia, fast heart rate, and they don't like it. They had only a handful of cases over 20 years of doing that. So it's not very common. You know, an allergic reaction can happen to anything, but that common with iodine, it can happen. And, you know, I see, like I said before, I people tell me they can't water or they, or they get vitamin C gives them a headache or something. And so, you know, but it's, it's rare, it's rare. I haven't seen any terrible effects with iodine. And I, I've had a lot of people be able to take iodine and tell me they get anaphylaxis with a uh, CAT scan radioactive iodine dye, and they can take inorganic non-radioactive iodine very fine without any reaction to it. Mm-hmm. That's good that you threw that in there. Those are two different things. Mm-hmm. I get this question occasionally. People will say, I don't have my thyroid gland anymore. Does all of this information change for me? The thyroid gland holds, it has the highest concentration of iodine in the body, but a very small amount of iodine. I, you know, the number's in my book, and of course, I should have that memorized, but I don't. But it, it holds less than 2% of the body's iodine. in the. So you got 98, 99% of iodine in the skin, the muscles, the pancreas, the brain, you know, everywhere else in the body. So just because you don't have a thyroid, you have skin, you have breasts, you have mm-hmm. prostate, you have ovaries, you have uterus, whatever. Now, those tissues need iodine as well. Every cell in the body needs and requires iodine for optimal function. You said something earlier that I didn't underline that I wanted to. So many people talk about when they go into the ocean, but it's really, it varies. A lot of people, but not everyone, they talk about when they go in the ocean, oh, sometimes my skin gets better, my rashes or my eczema. 
But you brought up that the ocean is a good source of iodine. So it's possible that they're getting some sources and maybe seeing some changes from them, which I had not really considered or thought about that that could be a cofactor. Before. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's true. Yeah. Okay. So I get asked about food all the time. My approach is don't restrict things that you don't need to restrict, but there's a lot of discussion about gluten, soy, dairy, and you have books about each one of those. So do you have anything you want to say about food avoidance in most cases of thyroid issues, or do you think it just depends on the person and how they're responding? I think this comes up mostly in Hashimoto's. I think everyone's a unique biochemical individual and needs to be treated as such, but I can tell you most Hashimoto's patients do well without gluten. They, they do better without gluten. The um, Hashimoto's is an autoimmune problem of the thyroid gland. It's really common in our, wasn't common 30 years ago. It's really common now. And it's common now because of iodine deficiency. You'll see some in the holistic world say iodine is causing Hashimoto's disease. Absolutely not true. What do you say? Fake news, misinformation, whatever terms you want to use there. I talk about that in my iodine book and my thyroid book. But, you know, the number one food allergy I see in patients is dairy. Number two is gluten. And then it varies, you know, beyond that. I'm not so sure if it's really, I mean, where were these allergies 30 years ago when I was young, 50 years ago when I was in school, you know, elementary school? They weren't there. Why are they there now? So I think it's probably more associated with how we're treating the food. Yeah, there's several, several how factors. It gives there. to us. And there's several reasons for that, such as glyphosate over every grain that's on the market and, you know, ultra pasteurizing dairy and distorting the proteins in dairy, probably causing us all these dairy problems. And, you know, so whatever, but whatever that is, people with Hashimoto's generally do better I know, without gluten as part of it, whether it's glyphosate or gluten, you know, whatever, they'll lower it without gluten. And people with asthma and eczema and, you know, some other things, I check blood levels of these so I can see them on people. 75, 80% are, I have casein antibodies that are through the roof. They do better without casein from cow's milk. I think I just have one more question because the rest of these are honestly covered by, you know, when someone says I have Hashimoto's and take Synthroid daily, what are your recommendations for improving hair loss? I feel like there's a lot of good information in both of those books. And we talked about a lot of good stuff there already. And when people say, hey, my doctor says my my thyroid lab tests are fine. I think you have to go back to, did you actually check everything? And what about what's, you know, you can trust your symptoms. But this one popped up about sluggish thyroid and fungal overgrowth. Any comments of the interplay you see with these two? Absolutely. There's a big interplay with that. And there's big interplay with fungus and candida and mold with low iodine. Mm -hmm. Big play. And it just allows um, them to thrive. Yes. Yeah. Low basal body temperature. Yep. All right. Dr. Brownstein, thanks for telling us so many good little nuggets today and going through things that I think we needed to try to share with more people. Where can people find you online? So you can go to my website, www.drbrownstein, B-R-O-W-N-S-T-E-I-N.com. And all the books are there. And my office is Center for Holistic Medicine.com in West Bloomfield, Michigan. I'm not really seeing new patients right now, but I have a daughter, Haley, who is, and my other daughter, Jessie, will be there in July seeing new patients. So we've still got room to grow in our practice, although we're we're getting there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we'll, we all like what we do. We're all on the same page of that office. And I got what I wanted 30 years ago, which was secretaries. The And actually, it's funny. I got an electrician who's our patient. I got a plumber who's my patient. I got all these, you know, the water filter guys, my patient. You know, they're, we're all on the same page. We're all trying to do the same thing. And, you know, it's a pretty cool office to work in. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Well, I would highly recommend as someone who's got a lot of these books, go get them. They're great. They've changed the way I think and practice. And I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Sharing and reviewing this podcast is the best way to help us succeed with our mission to help integrate the best of East and West and empower you to raise the bar on your health story. Just go to review this podcast.com forward slash less stressed life. That's review this podcast.com forward slash less stressed life. And you'll be taken directly to a page where you can insert your review and hit post.